March has literally lasted forever. And I don't think it's even going to end, even though I'm technically filming this in April. No, in here it's still March. So my original plan. I was just going to read like four books. Just take it easy. I just wanted a nice, calm month. And that's how it was for like the first two weeks. Just moseying along. I finished, what, three books? But then the final two weeks of March, I suddenly got the urge to read everything. So my TBR doubled from like four books to four, five. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Somewhere around there. Some may consider this an accomplishment, but it was fun, yes, but it was also a lot of stress. Cause I was like, I have to finish all these by March 31st. Thankfully I did. And I have some really, really good books, some weird DNFs, and a great big disappointment. Just you wait. But let's start with the DNFs first. Okay, I saw this movie before I read the book and I loved the movie and that made me want to read the book more. It's the Giver by Lois Lowry. Way back in the day, middle school Casey was given the choice to read a book called Hoot or The Giver. And you know, you look at Hoot, it has that cute little owl on it and it looks so friendly and fun. And The Giver, it looked like Galileo. And I was like, oh, that looks science-y. I don't want to read it. I read The Giver. I give it a three stars. This book is about a society that has embraced sameness, war, poverty, Famine, everything has been eliminated because they have embraced sameness. The most important thing in this world is the community which is run by the elders. The elders, when little kids are growing up, they observe the children and once they reach 12, I believe, they decide what job these children will go into. Will they be like lawn care dudes? Will they be teachers? And so when our main character Jonas becomes 12, he is told that no, he's not gonna be a regular guy. He's not gonna have a regular bakery job. He has been chosen to be the receiver. The guy who apparently holds all the memories of mankind, basically. I don't know how they manage that. And he is to be given into the tutelage of the former receiver, who's like an old man now, and he's about to, you know, age out. <laughs> He's about to be released into elsewhere. And so now this old receiver has become the giver. He is transmitting these memories to our protagonist, Jonah. Jonas. Jonah's the guy with the whale. But having embraced sameness, none of these people have known love. They barely know pain. They do not know happiness. They're not even allowed to feel like they're hormones because they like have to take these little pills every morning that just like suppresses everything. So you're... But more like... There. I thought this book had like a very calming atmosphere. Even though it was very eerie, I think as dystopians go, this was a very good setting because I remember back in English class, we read some other dystopian that was like, oh, 1984. One that's like based on pain as a reward for like misconduct versus like, um, Brave New World, which kept citizens super happy so they wouldn't want to rebel or anything. And the giver falls into the super happy category, which as a sociopath, a villain lover sort of person. I'm like, that is the best way to run your dictatorship. Keep everybody happy while you rake in all the monies. So I love the community aspect. I love Jonah. Jonah, his name's Jonas. I love the giver, that crotchety old man. He was cool. The book was only like 200 pages, the first one. This big book I have, it has all four books, four books. And here we have the problem. So I read the first book, The Giver, three stars, cause I did enjoy myself, love the characters, but it was very short and it left so much stuff unanswered. Like, how did the sameness start? How are the memories in one person and they get transferred to another person? Why do the people who have access to these memories have blue eyes? Do I have access to these memories? What role does the elders play in all this? What happened to the world before sameness? And this book ends in such a way that if it was a standalone, it would be a very unhappy ending. And it was for a long time. There was, hold on a second. It took seven years for the sequel Gathering Blue to come out. So for a long, long time, the the Giver was a standalone and it had a pretty bleak ending. And if it was just that, just that standalone, this book may have gotten a higher rating even though I still would have been like less satisfied because it didn't answer any questions. But no, we get to three sequels that don't tie up nothing. The second book, Gathering Blue, starts out with a whole new character in a whole new sort of tribal environment. And I'm like, where the heck did all this come from? This has nothing to do with the first book. The main characters of the first book that have that like bleak ending, they're not in that book. And also it was boring. I didn't like anyone there. So I DNF'd it 
got on my Wikipedia, because this is what I do when I DNF a book. I look up the spoilers to see if it's worth me going on. It wasn't. I looked up the next book. No. The next book is still boring. The summaries are just nothing I was into. And it looked like we got no answers out of any of this. I just think the author saw the opportunity to rake in that money and just like popped out some companion books that don't really tie up the world well. The first book I do want you to read. It's very nice. But I do think you should stop at the first book. And we have another book that started off so well, but then it started to bug me. Fifth wave, I DNF this, but this one, unlike The Giver, this is a temporary DNF. I wanna try again. I know there's stuff in this book that are that's like up my alley and I want to get into it, but oh my gosh. Okay, this book starts off so well. We have murder, we have alien invasions, we have the pandemic, oh gosh, spread by birds. We've got these alien visitors who decide to just wipe out humanity in these five waves. First one is like an EMP, so you know, goodbye airplanes. Second one I think is like a tidal wave, you know, corral those humans closer together inland. I think the third, is it a play? Yes it was, and the fourth one, you got these people hunting after you. Yeah, deal with it. I was loving the writing style. It had like a sarcastic thing to it, which is like up my alley. I love the sarcasm in characters. I was loving our girl, Cassie? Casey, probably? Hi, Casey, girl. You look good. This girl, Cassie, she's been struggling ever since the first wave. She lost her mom. She lost her dad. Where's her brother? Just so much tragedy happening back after back after back. The expression there is back to back to back to back, not back after back after back after back. And now she's just trudging alone in the wilderness, keeping away from everyone. Because you can't trust your fellow humans, no, because these aliens, they look like us. So you're best being solo. But uh-oh, tragedy strikes. She's shot. So now it's a standoff between her and her attacker. Will she have enough guts? And enough blood to withstand the fifth wave because, you know, she's shot and the blood is literally running, leaking out of her leg everywhere. I don't know because I DNF'd it. This is going to go into massive spoilers because I'm going to, like, lay out the entire villain plan and the shooter of the Cassie. We have such insta-love and it's crazy. Like, not the even little bit respectable insta-love. No, this one. Let's see how to get into this. Okay, this boy. I think his name is Evan. I can't even be... The, the villain plan, the alien plan in this series is so dumb. Oh my gosh. I went on a spoilery wet website and I can't even explain it. That's just how weird it is. Basically, this guy Evan, he is an alien. He is a silencer, so he, he is hunting down the humans. He spots Cassie through his scope shoots her and you know she's like waddling off holding her injured leg and from his scope he's like and she's kind of cute like you shoot her and now you're in love with her what so that was the first thing we also had my least favorite thing ever it's like when sections of the book are told in a certain person's point of view like first one's cassie the other's like a uh, soldier named zombie the other one is another guy but the thing is when we'd be getting into an intense point with cassie oh suddenly we're in zombie's point of view and then when we're starting to like zombie and we're getting into an intense point, oh, suddenly we're back at Cassie. And you are so intensely focused on what's happening with zombie that when you get back to Cassie, you've already forgotten everything that happened to Cassie in the first half because you've been so with zombie for the last like two hours of your life. It makes some poor pacing. And so all the surviving humans in this book, they manage to like get together, you know, make a little militia, do some intense army training. But when these cadets, they graduate from their little army secret hidden bases, you realize that their instructors are the aliens. Do you see the problem there? Aliens, why are you taking all this time and resources training these people to you know shoot and kill, then just to let them go out into the wild for a little bit and then just finish them off then. You are aliens. You have the technology to bomb us to kingdom come. You've already plagued us, flooded us, shocked us, and snipered us. Why are you taking the time now to train them and then just to kill them? This is what broke me. It was such a dumb villain plan that I DNF the book, went on the Wikipedias, and it got weirder. Like, I still want to read this book series, but I really don't like the evil villain plan. Let me see if I can like give a little log line of it. Okay, so the aliens put chips in the humans' minds that makes the humans think they're aliens. And so the human aliens kill the real humans. Can I not just bomb them? As a tactician, this didn't make any sense, so another time when I'm feeling less military.
I'm still interested, but not now. I really wanted to give the giver a chance, but I couldn't. But then the reading month got so good. So good. I'll be right back. Now, a duology that both got 3.5 stars from me. It is The Wrath and the Dawn by Renee Audidae. Uh, Audidae? Nope. Renee Audier. And also The Rose and the Dagger, which has a very bad cover. Actually, both of these covers suck. I realized to help me, like, collect all of my thoughts, I just need to keep a little tiny piece of paper in it. Because, you know, by the time, at the end of the month of the wrap-up, when it's time to wrap up, Usually I forget everything about the book because I have a bad memory, but now I have paper. Renee Audier has the best name ever. It rhymes and it just sounds so pretty. These two books are either a retelling of Thousand Nights or Aladdin. Maybe them together. Definitely them together. And okay, the girl's name, the main character, this is her name. I'm not going to even try to pronounce it, but they call her Shazi. I'm probably not even pronouncing that right. Shazi? I'll do Shazi. So she's going to be called Shazi from here out. So journey with me on your magic carpet to a wonderful Arabian night. We have here a dark kingdom lurking over the cold sands of the night, only to be burnt to a crisp in the summer and, uh, heat. I was trying hard to be poetic. This is what the book's about. This kingdom, its ruler, the Caliph, the Caliph Khalid, every night he he takes a new bride only to murder her by morning. Then he gets a new bride. Murder. Bride. Murder. Repeat. And you know, the kingdom, they're fed up with this. And this one girl, Shazi, she decides I volunteer as tribute. And she does. She volunteers to be the next bride. She gets all dolled up and you know they accept her. And she's going in there with the sole purpose to kill this evil king. But is it all a misunderstanding? It is. Or else there'd be no plot. This first book, the Wrath on the Dawn was so hard for me to get into at first because the plan, the plan is stupid. This caliph, he kills a woman every night. So what's Shazi going to do to avoid not getting killed her first night there? She thinks it will be an amazing idea. Chino, tell him the story and like get him so invested in the story that she'll refuse to finish it. And she'll like force him to keep her alive till the next night so she'll be able to finish the story then and then just keep repeating it over and over and over again. So your big plan is to just stay alive by telling a really good bedtime story. Dude, if I was Khaled in this and she tried to pull this jazz on me, I would have killed her right then. Like, oh, you smart Alec. You think you're so smart? No, stab. Renee Audier also has like a really flowery writing style, but she also uses some really extreme metaphors that don't make sense. Like I remember she said that one man's tone was like a spear dipped in sweet water. Like I like the visual image in my mind, but what does a spear dripping in sweet water sound like in a male voice? I don't know. Also, a long, long time ago, I went to a writing conference and the lady who was, what's it called? Reading my book for me, like editing, but not editing, just giving me some advice on what she sees in like my first 10 pages. She's like, okay, well, your character, Bob, you wrote here that he lifted his green eyes to look at the approaching car. And I'm like, yeah, that's what he did. She's like, well, he can't see that he has green eyes. And I'm like, but he knows he has green eyes. And she's like, but do we like ever think about our own green eyes? And she has a point. A character, especially in third person, should not be thinking about their like physical attributes. That's a good point, that editing lady way back then. But this book did it constantly and it drove me crazy. Like, Shazi paced forward, her hazel orbs trained on the caliph. She lifted her elfin chin. That drives me crazy right there. No. Have the other characters describe what that character looks like. That's how it should be done. No staying in front of mirrors, no thinking about how hot you are, no. There is a bit of insta-love in this, actually a lot of insta-love in this, and I really wasn't invested in any of the characters at first, and I, I didn't really feel like DNFing because I was still like interested, but I'm still like, mm, I just feel like I'm flowing through it, like not really feeling anything. But then around like the 150 mark, which is still like a long way to get into a book before like getting invested in it, I was like, oh, okay, I'm loving the story now. It's pretty good, I like it. The love affair, it's saucy. It has like two love tracks triangles, which is like my jam. One thing, however, I kept forgetting the two main characters, Khaled and Shazi, were married. I thought they were boyfriend and girlfriend the whole time. No, they're married. So that's something I had to like keep reminding myself. I do think one of the weaker things in this first book is the love triangle. We got Khalid, we have Shazi, and we also have Shazi's old love back home, Tarek? I don't know how to pronounce cues. Tar Tarek? I don't know. This man, Tarek. I really don't like him. He just likes he tries to just shove himself into the love affair happening over here and I'm like, no, you, you, 
you're not fun. Go, please. He's like, I will get my woman back. And I'm like, no, I like, I like her with the murdering monster, actually. No, thank you. The thing is, we are introduced to Tarek like that. He's just dropped in front of us. We're supposed to already like him. He's going to go save his lady. <sighs> and we never really got a chance to know him. His chapters were like shoved in between chapters of Shazi and Khalid living in the castle together. And I just think that made him like a weak corner of the love triangle. My rule of love triangles are I have to love each point in the love triangle to make it work. Did not like Tarek. He had a falcon though and I love the falcon more than him. And also Shazi. She's here to murder this man Khalid. Avenge one of her friends who was murdered before she arrived at the castle. And you know she starts to like be seduced by his murderous ways, I guess. <laughs> and during this whole time, whenever Khalid's around, she never thinks of Tarek, even though they were like best friends forever and lovers. So I definitely think this book needed to just drop Tarek all together, make it just about Kali, Kali, Khalid, and Shazi. And also when we first met Shazi, she's just there. We don't really get to know her. She's like right in the situation already. So I think of all the time we could have like saved writing about Tarek, got rid of him, and have some more like getting to know Shazi before she gets in this situation. That would make me like, like her more at the beginning. Eventually I did like, like her. I still like her, but it took a while. The second book, however, The Rose and the Dagger, had an even better love triangle. It was juicy. <laughs> it was with, let's see, Despina Jalal? Jello? J-A-L-A-L. -A -L -L. Also Vikram. Those three. Those are some pretty good side characters. I like them. You got the tall, brooding bodyguard, the chatty handmaiden, and also just the wise cracking other bodyguard. And those three together were just really fun. I really like the side characters in this book. But there were some I really didn't like, such as Tarek and also Shazi's sister who gets introduced in this book. I hated her. She caused so many problems just because she existed. <laughs> she has these moments because she's like a timid, quiet sort of gal. And she has these little internal dialogues where she's comparing herself to a mouse, basically. She's like, I will not be a mouse. I I will not be a mouse. So whenever two people are fighting, she yells, stop! And then they will like stop fighting. But then immediately after that, something bad would happen and she would just like get in the way and start crying again. So did not like her. And also there are some times in this book where I could not tell who, whose point of view we were in, especially if they were like of the same sex. Sometimes I could not tell if we were with Shazi or if we were in Ursa. I had again, some more weird metaphors like, let's see here. What a ridiculous thing to apologize for. Shiva's fine bone features looked doll-like in her outrage. How would you compare a doll to outrage? Like, I don't even think Chucky looks all that mad. This book is a bit more action-y than the first book, if you're into that. I'm into just cool characters and action, so I was 3.5 for both of them. However, this book also tries to like interweave a war around these characters. It's hardly done well. No, not really. They had a giant dragon and barely used it. There's a point where one army just sets fire to like the walls of another city and they just like give up automatically. I'm like, it's just fire. Come on. Put up a fight. So again, I think the war should have just been like shoved off along with Tarek and we would have had a much better book where we could have just like built some more relationship out of it. But it was funny. I have a little pink thing right here for when I actually laughed out loud. Khalid and Shazi are very good characters, I believe. Side characters, except for Ursa. Pretty decent and funny. It is very atmospheric. I love the way Renee Audier just describes like food. It makes me hungry. So definitely go give it a try. My next four store book is a book I've had very polarized reviews for. I hear people either love it and how it's so flowery and just like atmospheric, or people think it's too flowery and it's too short for a fantasy book. That would be An Enchantment of Raven. I loved the couple in this book. Rook and Is- I'm just clumsy today. Rook and Isabel. Oh my gosh, they're so cute, especially Rook. What we have here is a fantasy where fairies and normal human people coexist with each other. We live in this country, which I believe is called Whimsy, and the fairy people, though they are immortal, they cannot do any crafts at the cost of their life. They can't make fires, they can't cook, they can't paint, they can't draw, they can't write. So they hire these humans to do it for them. They order paintings of themselves. They want people to make their necklaces. So, you know, the humans are making some money off of this. So capitalism, it's a symbiotic relationship. However, you gotta be careful when dealing with these fairies because you know, they're naughty little tricksters. If a fairy comes into your office one day and asks for you to like commission them a painting and you say, okay, yes, sir. Um, let's talk about payment. I would love, you know, a bucket full of gold. And the fairy's like, oh, sure, I can do that. And you finish the painting and you give it to the fairy. And the fairy's like, 
okay, here's your bucket full of gold, sir. And so the bucket full of gold materializes over your head, falls on top of you, and kills you. You gotta be careful. You have to word what you want as your reward very specifically, or they'll just turn it all up on you. With a curse, an enchantment gone wrong, they might turn your goats into human children. It happened, and I love those goats. And Isabel, she's young, 17 I believe, but She's like the master painter of her country. All the fairies love to come to her to get their paintings done. But then, out of the blue, the Prince of the Autumn Court, I think that's what it is? He hasn't been seen in a long time, but out of the blue, he's like, I would like a picture too. I make him sound like stiff, but he is the sweetest, cutest thing ever. His name's Rook. I love him. He can turn into a raven and a horse. That's very handy. So Isabel's like, okay, I'll make your painting. And you know, they're like sitting next to each other and she's like feeling the contours of his face while she's like painting him with the delicate strokes of her paintbrush. They cozy up to each other on the couch with the sunset gently streaming upon their bare shoulders. Mm. So they get to like know each other and like maybe there's a little something something going on. But then uh oh, she accidentally paints the hint of mortal sadness she sees in his eyes, betraying the weakness that he has in his heart. He can't let other people see this in his courts or they'll throw him out of his throne room. He won't be king anymore. So he drags Isabel off to make her pay for her crimes. Even though it's not a crime, man, he could have just like, oh, I don't know, look at the painting before you showed it to everyone in your court, like you ripped off the cover and didn't even look before to make sure everything was okay, that was on you, my friend. And so we just go on this amazing adventure into the fairy world, and this book, it's so short. Under 300 pages, and it was done so well. I want, like, another book of this, please. I really like the writing style. It was, like, pretty and flowery enough, but without getting too distracting. However, at the end, where, like, some action-y climax stuff happens, it does get a little tangled because of all the big, pretty words, so it's, like, hard to tell what's actually happening. But aside from that, and that's honestly what knocked it down from a five-star, to the four star it is. I really loved it. Did I mention I love Rook? He's like confident but he's also like not confident but he's shy but he also like knows what he wants and he's not afraid to tell you and he's also like confused by mortal stuff and he's like so hard to figure Isabel out. <sighs> I love it. It was just so sweet. We had that like small tiny small I'm not like other girls moment where Rook's like oh you're gorgeous and Isabel she's like I am not gorgeous I'm in the middle and I'm like honey if you look like the girl on this cover, you're like a 10. Shut up. <laughs> and just run off with the pretty fairy lord. We also get to learn in this book what this mysterious green well sort of sinister object is. And how most mortals covet it, but Isabel is petrified of it. The green well is just a well. You reach into it, you drink some water. Oh, you're a fairy now. Cool. And you know Rook, he takes Isabel to the green well. And they're like sitting on it and she doesn't know what it is. He's like, oh, hey, um, I brought you to the green well if you, you wanna, you know, just we could live forever together. And Isabel's like, I can't. I love painting more than anything. If I'm a fairy, then I can't craft. I can't paint. I'll lose what I am. And I know if I had been Isabel and I was offered the same chance to know, be with Rook, my love, the guy who is rivaling with Kaz Brecker for my heart, if he offered me a drink from the well, I would be like <clears throat> marry me I have no shame if you want to read a cute love story that you're just gonna wish was a bit longer and you're not gonna mind some flowery words go read it you'll love it Rook is mine okay like I said month has lasted month that <laughs> March has lasted forever so let's see if I can remember what this book is about this was good. The Escape Room. Now, this title and like the summary is very misleading. I thought it would be just about people stuck in an escape room, finding the clues in the escape room, getting out. But no, it's much more than that. It starts out with these four like tycoons of the business world. They enter into this escape room as a corporate exercise that they are forced to do because some of them haven't been performing too well. And this is like gonna help decide who's gonna get canned and who's gonna stay. We alternate between these chapters in the escape room with other chapters of this employee named Sarah who just got a job at the same business these four tycoons work in. The storyline shifts between past and present, and it was so nice. I tend to like really simple books to have a nice thriller premise, but the characters make it even more better. More better. That that was some bad grammar right there. I am sorry. They just make it amazing. I love just like the business aspect of this book. We have like the nice thriller aspect of being stuck in the escape room, but we also had like the shady like corporate moves of a business like this. The like tensions of this like new hire 
just like trying to navigate her way through the world, which is very misogynistic, by the way. Didn't know if you knew that. <laughs> the struggles the young lady faces, the hope she has for this high paying job, her love affairs. I really like Sarah as a protagonist. She was very good. She handled things like a human would. She had to deal with some stuff that made me feel honestly bad. One of the things that makes it hard for me to read books is when characters are, are accused of something that they didn't do. Like if someone did that to me, I would just start crying because I just hate that feeling of guilt that isn't even like pertaining to me, but people's like judgment pressing it down on my shoulders makes me want to cry. <laughs> and when this happened, our character had the chance, she had the like evidence to back her up, but she just wasn't given the chance to like say it. I was like, girl, open your mouth. <laughs> As a business major, this book makes me nervous about my future career. If you want to read about some shady dealings and some claustrophobic escape rooms, this is a good one, I believe. All five major characters in this book, really real. There was one like superior over our four tycoons who was like painted as the big bad guy not the villain bad guy just like this actually terrible guy in the workplace like we were told like all the bad things he's done but we never actually got to meet him we just like heard second hand accounts of what he's done I'm like oh we should actually met this loser I'm like he sounds like a nice villain a nice obstacle for our girl Sarah working in the same business as him but they never crossed paths I think that was a big missed opportunity also there's a guy named Kevin in this book when you read this book second you see his name punch him for me I hate Kevin. Five stars. Very nice. Oh, I almost forgot. I love the way this ended because it, everything wrapped up so nicely, but it left one little thing open-ended that where I'm like, I want a sequel. I really do. <clears throat> <clears throat> the last three books I want to talk about today in this very long wrap up, my clock is telling me, it's a trilogy. This trilogy, it has excited me, it's made me tremble, and it ultimately wounded me. It gave me everything I could have wanted and then just crushed it all in one fell swoop. What's, what, what trilogy is this? I'll show you. The I Hunt Killers trilogy by Barry Liga, followed by the sequel, Game, followed by the trequel, Blood of My Blood. <sighs> this book is so gory. We're gonna talk about the first book first, obviously. I Hunt Killers, the world's most notorious serial killer, is Billy Dent. He has killed about 150 people, most of them women. He got away with it for so many years, even had a son and raised him to follow up in his footsteps. But dear old dad got captured. He's been living in jail for the past four years, leaving his now 17-year-old son to deal with the aftermath. He's the pariah of their small town, Lobo's Nod. Interesting name once you read into the book series. Our character, Jazz, the son of the serial killer, wants to believe that the same craziness can't be inherited, but he's starting to think that it is because he's looking at people and he's like, you're like a walking anatomy session. I can separate that joint from that joint and make you scream loudly. I loved him so much. Oh, the dad and the son in this book Billy and Jazz, Jasper. I loved it. It was my favorite trope. The I am your father trope. Evil dad wants his son to be as evil as he is and take up his mantle and go on a murderous rampage. I was so happy. While Jasper is living out his life with his crazy grandma, a new serial killer rears his head in their small town, and Jasper decides to clear his name of any synonymous serial killer intentions. He's gonna track down and catch this killer with the help of his trusty but very annoying side characters, Howie and Connie. This book was a five stars. It gave me everything I wanted. We had the main character battling against his inner desires to rip people apart from their limbs and sides. Pockets. And I like that. We had him knowing deep in his heart that to catch this killer, he's gonna have to get some advice from dear old dad locked up in prison. Oh, I loved the dad, Billy. He is the most scummy human being ever, but he's the villain and he is amazing. <laughs> he pretends he's this good old country boy, but he's really like a nuclear scientist sociopath in disguise. Yeah. <laughs> but the story is about Jasmine like trying to be as human as possible and not wanting to be a murderer, even though he's like feeling the heavy inclination to rip his girlfriend apart right now. And he was trying so hard to be a nice guy. His friend Howie has hemophilia, so that means like he bleeds and bruises at the slightest touch, basically. That means this poor guy Howie, he can't get any tattoos without like dying. So Jazz, his best friend is like, dude, pick a tattoo and I'll go get it. And so he does. So Jazz, the toughest boy in existence, has like a Yosemite Sam tattoo all down his back. It is stupid. <laughs> I just love it. He's so tough, but he has like the corniest, awkwardest, babyish tattoos anyone could ever imagine all over him. I would say that is a sign of good friendship right there, but one of the biggest, baddest parts of this book is the side characters. Howie is the standard comedian of the group. 
he doesn't contribute much. We do have another character called G. William. He is the sheriff and he's the first one to say, hey, Jazz, we have this new serial killer and I might need your help. And Jazz is like, okay, I'll help you. No, I don't want your help. You're just a kid. See, that it, he does that all the time. He like brings Jazz these little facts about the situation, about this guy murdering all these other women. And when Jazz is like, okay, I'll come help. G. William's like, no, you can't help. Then why'd you tell him about the killings. I don't like that. When people like ask for someone's help and then when they tell them what they should do, they're like, no, I don't want your advice. It doesn't make any sense. It had insanely dark humor. It is very gory. There was one murder where I literally said dang out loud. Dang. Like imagine a bomb going off inside of a person in your living room. Blood everywhere. However, the weirdest but biggest biggest issue I had with this book is the weirdest thing I will ever say about a relationship. <sighs> So Jasper has a girlfriend. Her name is Connie. She's black. She's black. She's black. Did I tell you she's black? She's very black. She is black. We gotta let you know she's black. She's black. Their relationship is not built on love. It's about how not racist it is. Like we, every time they're together, they talk about how like not racist they are for loving each other. And I'm like, oh, congratulations. Yeah, that's good. But you got anything else? There's this like deeper meaning about like how Jasper's dad, Billy, he killed all these women, but he never killed a black girl. So Jasper, he was like indoctrinated to kill. So he thinks dating a black girl because Billy never killed one makes them safe. No, guys, don't go to me for relationship advice. I've fallen in love with a terrorist known as Kaz Brecker. I want the Darkling to just obliterate Rafka and all the rest of the globe off the map. Currently in love with a man who's murdered 70 women at least. But I've gotten so many red flags from this relationship. I'm like, girl, no, you'll need to run. <laughs> Get the gun. <laughs> they were literally sitting in their little hideout together, just talking, and he like looks up and he's like, I could really kill you right now. Like we're in the middle of nowhere. No, that's not good. And Connie's an idiot. She's like, I see the good of you. I love you, even though you're white. <sighs> Did I mention she's black? And this book ended so well. Like, I guessed the twist, but there was like a twist within the twist. So I didn't guess the twist, but I was close enough to think I was smart. Only bad things were the relationship that is solely built on how not racist it is. It doesn't, I just want love, come on. But then we got to the sequel, Game. Three stars. It started off so well. Why do I have a piece of toilet paper in here? Oh yeah, I like that scene. Started off so well, guys. You guys read the back. Like I did, you would know Billy escaped from prison, which is not a spoiler. It's an incentive to read it because Billy has been unleashed and it's gonna be a trip. So we got Billy calling Jazz every now and then like, howdy son, you dismembered any ladies lately? No, dad. Well darn tootin', why ain't you getting to that? And then we have like this league of serial killers that come up, a game that is being played. Duh. And it's up to Jazz to like find out who's running the game, who's the participants in the game in New York City. And you know, he like goes to New York and there's so many people. He's like, oh, I could kill so many people and you wouldn't know one was missing. I love that boy. But mm, 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 mm. The first book, Howie and Connie existed. Connie's black. But they didn't have point of view chapters, no. They're all in this mess. Howie's just horny. And Connie is so dumb. They are literally just taking time away from Jazz and Billy who are doing the most messed up stuff ever, and I loved it. We also had like some bigger issues with the same thing that happened in the first book. The police asked for Jazz's help, but when he like actually like tries to help him, like, no, we don't want your help, you're just a kid. Why'd you ask? That repeats. Again, it ended so well, like triple terror well when you read it. But all the chemistry that is like, ooh, the like, vi the vile top votile? Violet. Why can't I pronounce words right? I'm gonna think of a synonym, hold on. I'm not moving off the subject. The explosive dynamic between father and son. That was great. We didn't have that with any of the other characters. So again, I hated their point of views. So I hated half the book because they took up half the book. Again, very bloody. That was nice. And then two stars. It started off beautiful. I'm gonna do a skit real quick. I hope you guys like this. It's gonna be super low budget. This is an approximation on how it like starts. We got Billy who's on a murderous rampage. First I'm gonna dislocate your clavicle, then I'm gonna split apart your sternum, <clears throat> then I'm gonna make a hoe down of your... Well howdy there. Jasper how you doing? Dad? 
I've been shot. Billy really loves his kid. So after like leaving his latest victim on the floor bleeding, Billy runs off to the little place where his son is hurt. And he's like, son, son, I brought meds. Where are you? I'm on the floor dying. So Billy goes to work like operating on Jazz who has a bullet in his leg in the process of probably dying. So Billy, you know, he's working on his son. He's sewing him up. He has like the clamp trying to get the bullet out and he doesn't have the cleanest of potties in his mouth. If you get my drift. So as he's sewing his son up, he's like, why the bloopity bloop? Did you let those bloopity bloopers go bloopity bloop on your blooping leg? <laughs> and Jazz is just crying on the floor. But when Billy like moves his leg just a little too far, the pain shoots through him and Jazz is like, holy bloopity bloop, dad. And Billy slaps him and he's like, language! <laughs> Hypocrite. <laughs> That was my favorite scene in the whole book. It was so good at first, but then I read Ninth House. I read reviews about Ninth House. I gave it four stars. I actually liked it. I actually kind of want to reread it and I'm excited for the next book. But I read so many reviews saying that it had just like shock value in it, that certain things in it only existed just to make someone go, ow, wow, oh, that makes me uncomfortable. And though I do know what scenes they're talking about, I never thought that they weren't part of the story. Like I thought they were intrigued, inter interwoven into the story well enough that they had a place and it didn't feel like out of place. It was some gruesome stuff and it was shocking, but not shock value. However, this book. We don't play that. It did not have to have any part of this story. No, not shanasty. Automatic two-star decreasal. And again, we had Howie and Connie taking up the pages. The plot got really convoluted with the game in the serial killer league of the second book. Something that sounds so good, but just wasn't like pulled off right. It was a really big disappointment. I loved the first book. Second book was okay. Third book started off so well and funny. Just read the first book. Second and third book weren't really worth it. And I'm sorry, Billy and Jazz. I loved your dynamic, but I gotta let you go. Fly away, little crow. You were loved. I'm gonna miss Billy. Yeah. So that's what I had for this month. I had some big books, some good books, some DNFs, and some disappointments. Why'd you have to go that way? It doesn't make sense and you didn't need it. But I'm going to have an exciting April because I'm going to do an amazing TBR video that will probably embarrass me, but it shall be done and you shall be witnesses. Thank you guys so much for watching. I am Casey. I have meds and you have a glorious smile.